ladies and gentlemen. The floor is for Mr. Pellet. It's a real pleasure to be here in Amsterdam and to speak to you about Palestine. And I understand the Dutch Parliament is going to be discussing uh, a few aspects of Palestine coming up soon, uh, which is, of course, very, very important. I think the, um, the entire attitude of uh, Europe and the EU towards Palestine has been, how shall I say, um, without, some, well, I'll, I'll say what I think it is. I think it's, it's, it's the height of hypocrisy. And I understand that they're going to be discussing the issue of the labels, uh, labeling the products from the West Bank, from Israeli settlements in the West Bank, which is very interesting because it just so happens that a few weeks ago I was at a conference in Jerusalem and the EU ambassador to Tel Aviv was there on a panel and he said, and I quote, we in the EU welcome the products made in the Israeli settlements in the, well, in the West Bank. We welcome them. The only reason for the, um, for the labeling is just for information. Because officially it's not recognized as Israel, so people just need to know it's not made in Israel, it's made in a different place. But other than that, he said, we welcome. So the whole discussion on this issue is, is complete hypocrisy. Because you either accept the occupation or you reject the occupation. And what they're trying to do, I believe, in Europe is to find some kind of a very strange middle ground. Um, and that doesn't work in issues like this. So um, if they were to do something courageous, which is not likely, but if they were to do something courageous, they would probably opt to completely boycott and ban uh, products um, that are products that are made in areas that are considered illegal, illegal settlements. But I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. Um, I like to start. I like to start my uh, talk. And by the way, what I will be talking about tonight is two stories. I'll be talking about my book, The General Son, Journey of an Israeli in Palestine, and what that means, and about the history and the story of Israel and Palestine, and the areas where these two stories converge. That's really my experience. Um, as the book suggests, my father was a general, and that at some point in my life, I embarked on a journey, being an Israeli, on a journey into Palestine. Now, if you know anything about it, as I believe most of you do, it's a very small country, so it's a very short journey. The journey for an Israeli to go into Palestine is geographically very short. The journey of an Israeli living in the sphere of the privileged occupier and oppressor into the sphere of the other, the sphere of the occupied, the sphere of the oppressed, the sphere of the terrorist, is mentally a very, emotionally, is a very big journey, is a serious journey, and that is the story. Because in Palestine, whether you call it Palestine or Israel, you're never more than a 10 minute drive, sometimes a 10 minute walk. Um, and there's never more than this very short distance between an Israeli town or an Israeli community, a Jewish community, and a Palestinian community. So geographically, it's really not a very big journey. So these are the first few questions I'd like to ask. First of all, Israel and Palestine, is it one country or two? Is it one state or two? And the reason I ask these questions is because the way people talk about Israel, Palestine, they refer to it as though it's two different places. I've been to Israel and I've been to Palestine. This thing happened in Israel, this thing happened in Palestine. And then of course we know that several European countries have recognized the state of Palestine. And my question is, if there is such a place as Palestine, which is separate from this other place called Israel, where exactly is it? And if there is a Palestinian state, my question is, where is that? Where is this Palestinian state that people have been recognizing, the Europeans have been recognizing? Because I was born and raised there. I spent a great deal of time there. And I've yet to see the state. What exactly are the boundaries of the state of Palestine? What is the capital city? Who are the citizens? You know, these are all questions that are very unclear. But we have this recognition. And we have ambassadors, and there's a president, and so forth. But does it really exist? 
And my argument is that, of course, it does not exist. Now, two more questions. We know that in Palestine, we know that in Palestine there is what they call a conflict. And the choice of the word conflict is an interesting choice. Can you imagine if during the German occupation, people would have referred to the German occupation as the Dutch-German conflict? And Holland would be referred to as disputed territories um, and not an occupation. Of course, this would enrage people. If somebody was to suggest today that what took place here was, uh, or the, that the Holland was a disputed territory and this was just a conflict, then I suspect this person would be thrown out of the room, and rightly so. So the way the words that we choose to describe what is happening in Palestine are, I think, very important. But um, we need to understand what is happening there. We need to recognize and very, be very clear about what the reality is because eventually we want to see an end to it. We want to see peace. We want to see justice. We want to see people living as normal people should. Um, now, if we have a situation where we have two countries at war, two states at war, two armies battling each other, then certainly peace talks are the right thing. That's how we bring about peace between countries who are, that are at war. But there have been peace talks going on for several decades and nothing seems to be happening. Well, nothing good seems to be happening, I should say. It's not a status quo, things are getting worse. Um, so perhaps this is not the situation. Perhaps the reality is that it is one country with two people. It is one state governing two people. It is one army that serves one, pre one nation against the other. In other words, not a situation of war between two countries, but a situation of occupation and oppression. In which case, peace talks are not relevant. Because when we have a story of occupation and oppression, then the right thing is to engage in resistance. But if we're not clear about what the reality is, if we just call it a conflict, if we call the area disputed, if we accept all of these terms, then we will never reach the right conclusion on how to end the violence and how to allow people eventually to live in peace and justice and liberty. Now, it's very interesting how people talk about the history of the conflict. When we have groups of Israelis and Palestinians, you know, uh, dialogue groups, discussion groups, all kinds of camps and so forth where the two sides come together, and I just know this from my own experience, historically, the Israeli side always insists that we do not talk about the past that we do not talk about 1948. We need to talk about the present and perhaps the future. And what that does, it creates a, a reality where, where there's never any context. So suddenly there are rockets flying out of Gaza. <laughs> suddenly Palestinians are stabbing Israelis. Suddenly Israel attacks here or attacks there. Suddenly Israel attacks Lebanon. And without any context, of course, we cannot understand why this is happening. And if we don't understand why this is happening, of course, we can never reach the right conclusion. So I think it's extremely important to put things in context. And one of the things I'm going to try to do tonight is do that, put it in context, so that we see the clear beginning, we can understand where we stand today, and that we can understand where we need to go and be absolutely clear about where it is that we need to go if we want to see an end to the violence. So I think it's fair to say that even though there's a claim out there that the conflict in Palestine has been going on for hundreds of thousands of years, and even though people say it is a very, very complicated and protracted conflict, if we want to pinpoint, pinpoint the reasons for the reasons, the reasons there is a conflict in Palestine, then we need to look no farther than racism and colonialism that came from Europe. That is the source of the trouble, of the problem in Palestine. Not only Palestine, but certainly Palestine. And I'm sure, I'm sure that many of you, if not all, have heard of the Balfour Declaration. Now, growing up as an Israeli, you would think that the Balfour Declaration is one of the Ten Commandments. 
that it came down the mountain with Moses and that Balfour was some kind of, an, of a prophet or a saint. Every city, almost every city in Israel has a Balfour street or a Balfour plaza. And growing up, you think that Balfour was, you know, at least a prophet, maybe a king, a Jewish king. <laughs> and what is the Balfour Declaration? Lord Balfour, who was the Foreign Secretary of Great Britain, promising a Jewish millionaire by the name of Rothschild, Palestine for the Jewish people. In other words, one white European racist offering another white European racist, the country that belongs to somebody else. Neither one of them had anything to do with Palestine. But of course, these were days where it was okay, it was completely acceptable for white Europeans to take the country of non-Europeans and do with it as they will. Of course, this is still going on in many, in many places. So that's the Balfour Declaration. Now, several decades later, we had the United Nations intervene and come up with the partition plan of Palestine. And this is the map they came up with. And uh, today we walked around Amsterdam a little bit and we saw those, uh, what are they called, the bulldog coffee shops. And when we look at this map, when I look at this map, I get a sense that whoever drew the map must have been sitting in one of these coffee shops when they were drawing this map. I don't know how long, if they, if they were around in those days, but certainly something along those lines. First of all, when you look at the map, it's absurd. The boundaries are absurd. There's nothing there that is actually practical. But that's just one aspect of the madness. The other aspect of the madness, which really convinces me that they must have been high or drunk when they, when they drew this map and when they came up with this plan, is the following. In 1947, the entire Jewish community in Palestine numbered about half a million people. This was, these were the people who, like my grandparents, came from Eastern Europe to colonize Palestine, to immigrate to Palestine, if you want to call it that. And then my parents' generation, who were born there, first generation Israelis, if you will. That's it. It was a community that had practically just come out off the boat. The Palestinian, native Palestinian Arab community was about three times larger. Yet the partition plan, or in, this, in the partition plan, they allocate the larger portion of the country to the smaller Jewish community. And the local Palestinian native community was supposed to be satisfied with a smaller portion of the land. And this was somehow supposed to work. Even today, people say, you know, it's all the Palestinians' fault, this whole conflict, because they rejected the partition plan. Of course, who would not reject a, a, such a mad idea, such crazy, a crazy plan? But there is something else about this plan that is important to understand. What emerged the next day are two diametrically opposed narratives, two histories that are the absolute opposite of each other cannot be bridged, cannot be brought together. And when we accept one, we reject the other. It is that extreme. On the one hand, we have a story of revival and heroism. That's the story that I was brought up with, and that's the story that the West has accepted. This is the Zionist narrative. We, the Jews, returned after 2,000 years in exile, we, because we are reasonable people, accepted the partition plan. We were attacked viciously by Arabs. Thankfully, because we are the descendants of King David and we are the descendants of the Maccabees, we defeated the evil empire, the evil Arabs, and we were able to conquer the land and for the first time after 2,000 years, establish a homeland for the Jews in their historical biblical uh, country, in their historical biblical homeland. Now tell me if this doesn't sound like a whole new chapter in the Bible, in the Old Testament. It is so romantic, it is so heroic, it is so biblical, it is so messianic. How could it possibly be not true? How do we reject such an amazing story? 
And that is the story that the West has accepted, and this is the story that, as Israelis, we, uh, we are taught. The other story, like I said, doesn't differ in dates or nuance. The other story is a story of ethnic cleansing, occupation, and horrific terrorism. That is the Palestinian narrative. It is a horrifying story. Now, Palestinians have been saying this from the very beginning, but of course, nobody believes the Palestinians because we can't believe Arabs. About 20 years ago, several Israeli historians, the chief of whom is Ilan Pape, rewrote the history of 1948, dispelling the myths and validating the Palestinian narrative. Now, like I said, when Arabs say this, when Palestinians say this, when Muslims say this, of course we can't believe it. When an Israeli Jew of German background says it, now it's believable. Now people are beginning to pay attention. And only then, when Elon and the others started writing about this, people in the West began paying attention. And they validated the Palestinian narrative. Which is, like I said, a story of, 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 of ethnic cleansing and terrorism and occupation. Now, for Israelis, this narrative the narrative of heroism and revival is the holy grail. Israelis, it is part of our identity. It is part of who we are. We will defend this, and we do, or Israelis do try to defend this with everything they've got. It's a crucial element. It's a crucial part of Israelis' identity, of, of, of the identity of Israel and Israelis. And unless we understand these two narratives and how important they are, we will never understand the conflict. We will never understand what is happening in Palestine. Now, I'll tell you how I came to learn that there's something wrong with the Israeli narrative. And there's a story that I mentioned in the book. It's about my mother. And this is a picture of my mother when she was young. Now, she was born and raised in Jerusalem. She still lives in Jerusalem. She'll be 90 this year. Here she's about 22. And the story that she told me, and I don't really know why she told me this story so many times, but she repeated the story many times as I was growing up. And it's an ex uh, the story of her experience being in Jerusalem in 1948 when the, it wasn't an Israeli army yet, it was the, the Jewish militia, came in and conquered and took the Jewish neighborhood in Jerusalem. Now, I'm not talking about the old city of Jerusalem. I'm talking about the western side of Jerusalem, which later on became, became Israel. So these were very wealthy, very well-to-do, very prominent Jerusalemite, Palestinians, very, well, very wealthy. And the, the Jewish militia came, they took the houses, they took the neighborhood, and they forced the Palestinians to leave. And these homes, these very beautiful, very distinct Arab homes, were offered and given to Israeli families. And my mother was offered one of these homes. And the way she tells the story today, and she, we still talk about it, is just as passionate as she ever told it when I was a child. And she says simply, how can I possibly take the home of another mother? How can I take the home, move into the home of another family, which now lives in exile somewhere? And then she would describe the looting the soldiers filling up their trucks with loot, with you know, furniture and rugs and rare books and whatnot. And she talks about it, like I said, even today we still talk about this, with such great pain and with such great shame, saying, how could we have possibly done this? How wrong it was for us to do this, us as Israelis. Now, for me growing up, I could understand, obviously, that this is a very good, very important, very, you know, the, the right thing to do. It was a good story. The right thing to do. She made the right choice. But on the other hand, there was something that was very troubling for me when she told the story. And I couldn't really understand, I couldn't really reconcile why the story was bothering me until I was actually working on the book as an adult. And of course, what I realized was that her personal story was contradicting the national narrative. 
Because we don't do these things. We're the good guys. We're the Jews. We came back to reclaim our land. This was our country 2,000 years ago, but we're back. And then, like I said, we accepted the partition plan. We agreed for the Arabs to stay in a small, have their own country in a small part of our land. And then we defeated them and we fought them only because they attacked us. And then we asked them to stay and they left. We asked the Arabs to stay and they all got up and left. So where's the moral dilemma? What's wrong with taking the house of somebody who doesn't want their house anymore? There is no moral dilemma in the Zionist narrative. There is never a moral dilemma in the Israeli version of the story because we always maintain the moral high ground. Or at least we insist that we maintain the moral high ground, which is of course a very dangerous thing to do. Even now, as Israel bombs Gaza and everybody knows it's killing innocent civilians by the thousands, it's okay. We still maintain the moral high ground because Hamas is in Gaza and Hamas is like the devil. So it's okay. And yet, like I said, she was presenting a moral dilemma where I could not really see a moral dilemma because the narrative, the Zionist narrative is so perfect. Now, we very often hear the claim that there was no Palestine. There are no Palestinians. You heard the latest claim by this particular genius in the Israeli Knesset who said that there can't possibly be a Palestine because there's no P in the Arab language. <laughs> Did you hear that one? She said it in the Knesset. There cannot possibly be a Palestine because there is no P in the Arabic language. Just shows you how educated some of these people are. But anyway, we hear that there's no Palestine, that there are no Palestinians, or if there was a Palestine, and if there were Palestinians, then there were just a few poor farmers and a few dirty Bedouins with their camels. But really nothing substantial. Anything good, modern, developed that happened in Palestine happened as a result of the wonderful immigration by Jews. So I like to show this picture. It is one example, one example of a Palestinian town from before 1948, the city of Yaffa. The city of Yaffa was a city of about 120,000 people on the coast of the Mediterranean. It had a rich business life, a rich political life. Several newspapers were published in, uh, in Yaffa. Movie theaters, there's a famous Jamal Basha uh, concert hall where the biggest names in the Arab world would come to perform. Beautiful boulevards. <laughs> and this city of close to 120,000 in a matter of two weeks in the spring of 1948 was reduced to about 3,000 people, all concentrated in a single neighborhood with barbed wires and Israeli soldiers or Jewish soldiers surrounding them. And today, almost exactly on the ashes or the ruins of the city of Yaffa, we have the modern Israeli city of Tel Aviv, which, by the way, calls itself Tel Aviv Yaffa, as though there is some kind of an extension to some glorious past. And there still is a Palestinian community in Yaffa. They're neglected, they're subjected to racist laws, and they're subjected to constant harassment by the Israeli secret police, even though they're Israeli citizens. And this really raises the, a larger issue here, which is that Palestine is not just the West Bank and Gaza. This attempt that we've seen over the last several decades to reduce all of Palestine to these two small areas that, by the way, Israel created, is false. Because Yaffa is part of Palestine and Palestinians live there. And the Galilee is a part of Palestine and Palestinians live there. And Haifa and Akka and the Nakab Desert, of course, Jerusalem. It's all Palestine and Palestinians live everywhere. And Palestinians, regardless of where they live, within the larger Palestine or within Israel, if you want to call it that, are all subjected to racist laws, to discrimination, and to oppression by the occupier, which is Israel. So there's a larger picture here beyond the specific story of Yaffa. Now, I think it's important to talk a little bit about Gaza. So we know that there's this thing called the Gaza Strip. 
Why is there a Gaza Strip? How did Gaza suddenly become a strip? Gaza is an ancient city that's been there for a very long time. What is this strip? How was it created? Why is it there? So you can read the statistics. I won't repeat them. Um, just maybe to say that it's a very small place with a very large population. In 1948, or even as early or as late as the early 1950s, as the ethnic cleansing of Palestine was finishing up, they needed a place in which to herd the hundreds of thousands of refugees. So refugee camps were built around the city of Gaza, a line was drawn, and that is the Gaza Strip. That is why there's a Gaza Strip. Poor refugees have always been the majority of the population in the Gaza Strip. Poor homeless refugees. You can see very high unemployment, very high poverty rates, 90% of the water is not fit for drinking, no access to medicine, very little access to nutrition, very little access to electricity. But there's an interesting part of, the, of, the, of one, one particular data here, which is very interesting, which is the literacy rate in Gaza is one of the highest in the world. 92% literacy rate. Now normally when there's high literacy rate, there's low poverty. When there's high literacy rate, there's high employment. Why is it the opposite in Gaza? Because this reality is imposed on Gaza by Israel. The UN came out a while ago saying that by 2020, if nothing is done, by 2020, Gaza will be a humanitarian catastrophe. I think whoever wrote that needs to go to Gaza now and tell us why is it, how is it not a humanitarian catastrophe now and how has it not been a humanitarian catastrophe for decades? This reality is imposed on Gaza by Israel. Now never mind the bombing, I'll talk about that in a minute, but it's just reality. Imagine a child who has an ear infection and there's no access to antibiotics. Now imagine this happening five minutes away, five minutes drive from an Israeli city where there's electricity as much as you want, clean water as much as you need, access to every medicine you could possibly want. Five minutes away. But the people in Gaza have no access to that because they are locked up. That is, makes this even worse. Now, if we don't see the bigger picture, if we're not aware of the context, there's no reason, no way to understand why there's a strip, why there are refugees. None of this would have happened had it not been for the ethnic cleansing of 1948. The reason there's a strip, the reason there are refugees, the reason there's poverty, the reason there's Hamas, the reason there are Qassam rockets, is all related to the reality that was created by Israel in 1948. Now, we know that Israel attacks Gaza on a somewhat regular basis. What people often forget is that attacks on Gaza didn't begin in 2012 or, 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 or 2008. Attacks on Gaza began as soon as this Gaza Strip was created. Almost immediately, in the early 1950s, almost immediately as the Gaza Strip was drawn, Israeli commandos began entering Gaza in what they called punitive operations. They would go in and massacre people. They called them punitive operations and they were punishing them because the, there was a problem that they defined as infiltrators. Infiltrators trying to come in. Because after Israel kicked them out, Israel passed a law that made it illegal for them to return. So anybody that would come back, try to return, had to suffer. And by the way, in these pictures, this is, a, this is that same commando unit returning from one of these glorious operations. And I don't know if you can recognize Ariel Sharon, over here, the butcher, he was commander of that unit, the chubby guy. That's Ariel Sharon. So in those days, they would go in, kill dozens, perhaps kill hundreds, come out all heroic and excited, our guys, you know, having, having fought terrorism. Then later on, they stopped calling them infiltrators, they started calling them fidayin, which nobody really knew what that meant, but we know today it means fighters. Then they went and they called them terrorists. Now, of course, they call them Hamas. Another, develop, another development is that today the uh, technology has improved. 
So whereas they were only able to kill dozens or hundreds in the beginning, now with this modern technology they can kill thousands. In 51 days they killed about 2,500 people, injured close to 20,000. That's pretty, remar pretty remarkable. In 2014 they had 6,000 flyovers. 6,000 flyovers dropping millions of tons of bombs on a civilian population that has no defenses and really has no military force. Then they brought in the ground troops. And we were there at the time, we drove down to the border of the Gaza Strip, and there's one point in the south, which is where the ground forces enter. And as you approach, you see these fields with a very strange shade of green. And as you come closer, you see these are tanks. Hundreds and hundreds of tanks. You would think Rommel is back. What do they need all these tanks for? What do they need all these troops for? And then, of course, the United Nations brings in a commission to find out if war crimes were committed. Because just the fact that millions of tons of bombs were dropped on innocent civilians is not enough proof. They need to go in and they come out and they say, yes, there were abuses on both sides. That's their conclusion. And of course, I'm going to spare you what it, the, 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 the results in, in, in human catastrophe. But this is what it looks like. I took a couple of those pictures myself when I was in Gaza. And the one question that doesn't seem to be asked is why. As Israel is pounding Gaza and murdering innocent civilians in broad daylight in front of all of our eyes as we go on about life normally, as even Israelis go about life completely normally because we were there, life went on completely unhindered. Nobody asks why. Everybody accepts this absurd idea, this absurd claim that Israel is acting in self-defense. Self-defense. There's never been a tank in Gaza. There's never been a warplane in Gaza. There's never been a military force in Gaza. Self-defense against what? What self-defense? But everybody accepts it. Every politician in Europe, in the United States, every news broadcaster, every journalist, self-defense. As though Israel has some kind of a magic spell over everybody's brains and nobody is willing, nobody is able to understand. There is no self-defense here because there is no threat on the other side. There has never been a threat to Israel from Gaza. Anybody who knows anything about this issue knows whether they admit it or not is something else. Whether they're being honest about it is something else, but knows for sure there has never been a military threat, much less an existential threat to Israel from Gaza. It is complete nonsense to say otherwise. Yet everybody repeats self-defense because Israel says it's self-defense. So why? Why is it that for nearly seven decades the state of Israel is pounding Gaza, murdering civilians. And why is it getting away with it? Why is nobody saying anything? How do they get away with this? The existence of this humanitarian catastrophe, five minutes away from Israeli cities where everybody lives a completely normal life, is a threat to the legitimacy of Israel. It is a threat to the narrative, to that holy grail. That is the problem. Israel has only two choices. It has to do something about Gaza. And there are only two things it can do. Leaving it alone and doing nothing is not an option because it gets embarrassing. People are going to ask questions. So, one option would be to allow the refugees to go back to their home pay them restitution, rebuild Gaza, and allow people to live as they should. But of course we can't do that because we don't want, Israel doesn't want any more Arabs. The only other option is to murder them and say it's their fault because they're terrorists. And it seems to work. For almost seven decades, this magic trick of murdering innocent civilians, calling it self-defense and saying that they're terrorists seems to work and they continue and they do it very well. And year after year, decade after decade, the 
casualty count grows, the technology improves, and the world becomes more silent, even as we sit here today. And the tens of thousands of injured have no access to the excellent hospitals that are sometimes 10 minute drive away inside Israel. That is the problem. It is the legitimacy of the state of Israel that is, that is at question here, that's at stake here. Because this shows that there is no legitimacy. This is the test that shows that Israel has no legitimacy. And this is exactly what the European and the American politicians and journalists are afraid to say. And this is exactly what needs to be said. So a few years ago, I tried to get into Gaza myself. I tried several times. As an Israeli, I can't go through Israel because Israeli law prohibits that. So I tried to go through Egypt. But of course, Egyptian policy towards Gaza is the same as Israeli. I mean, they're complicit, they're collaborators. And so I couldn't go in through Egypt as well because the border is closed. And then at one point, somebody wrote me a message, a friend wrote me a message and asked me if I would consider coming into Gaza through the subway. And I thought, yes, of course, why not? How could I possibly refuse? Now, to drive from Jerusalem to Gaza is about an hour and 15 minutes. I had to drive from Jerusalem to Tel Aviv, fly from Tel Aviv to the very south to Eilat, cross the border into Egypt, into Sinai. That's where I met my friends and then drive all across Sinai to Rafah, which is where the tunnels used to be. We were sitting in Rafah, it was already late at night, waiting for the permission to access, to go through the tunnel, where I noticed it, was, it had been 14 hours by then, since I left my house in Jerusalem. 14 hours, and I wasn't even in Gaza, and really all I was gonna go is, you know, that, that distance. Finally the OK came in, and these are, this is the tunnel that I went through. The one picture on this side is the entryway, and then the other picture is the tunnel itself. And this is what they call the five-star tunnel, where you can actually walk, there's light, and so forth. And at the end of that, I was again, once again, in Palestine, in Gaza. That is the absurdity, that you have about two million people whose only lifeline were tunnels, and these tunnels weren't leading to Amsterdam, they were leading to Rafah on the Egyptian border, which is a dump. It's a refugee camp in itself. And that was the best they can do. Of course, now these tunnels have been destroyed by Sisi and his, and his minions and his forces. But imagine this reality where nearly two million people, in order to access food and water and medicine and anything else we need, had to go through tunnels. And the border is only maybe seven kilometers wide. And there were hundreds of tunnels there. That is a reality which is absolutely unacceptable inexcusable and unjustifiable. But the reality for Palestinians is severe everywhere, not only in Gaza. This is Jerusalem. Heavy military presence. Palestinians, young Palestinians being stopped and held and searched all the time, every day, everywhere you go. And shot. In this picture, we went to visit this young boy. He's 13 years old at a hospital. This is an Israeli hospital, Hadassah. And until the day, the morning that we went, to, we went to visit him in the evening, until that morning, he was handcuffed to the bed. Now, besides the absurd idea that you handcuff a 13-year-old to the bed, his leg was destroyed because Israeli soldiers shot his leg so many times and so severely that it had to be amputated. So he couldn't escape even if he wanted to because he couldn't walk. 13 year old, and what do they call him? A child terrorist. And now they talk about this new thing called a child terrorist. And the Israeli TV went and did a special documentary about how do these child terrorists happen? This sick, absurd, these sick, absurd ideas they come up with. A 13 year old terrorist. But this is the reality. And this is just one story one case that we happen to see and that we happen to visit. If you've been to Hebron, if you've driven uh, the, the, the road, Route 60 to Hebron, you know there's a very big intersection called the uh, Etzion Junction. And the Etzion Junction is an intersection of some of the most rabid, radical, violent Israeli settlers. 
and many Palestinian towns and cities that lead to Hebron. It's the southern part of the West Bank. Now, there's always been, there have always been problems in that intersection, and there's always been a very heavy military presence in that intersection. Now they have snipers. At about 10 or 12 points around this intersection, they have snipers. Just like this. Their eye on the sight, their finger on the trigger, sitting just like that, all over the place, waiting to just squeeze the trigger. That's all they have to do. And they don't aim at someone who looks like me. This is the reality. And this is one of the reasons why so many Palestinians are being killed. Hundreds and hundreds only since last October. And injured. A major intersection with not only military presence, but snipers. And then in Hebron itself, you have a reality where settlers are breathing down the necks of Palestinians trying to get their homes. Every time they do get a home, they get military presence guarding the settlers. And of course, the prize that they hope to win one day is this beautiful old city of Hebron, particularly from this particular angle, from Tel Ramida. It's a beautiful, beautiful old city. And this is the prize. This is what they're trying to win, house by house, and killing one Palestinian at a time. But what makes it even more absurd is that the difficulties, the persecution of Palestinians goes on outside of Palestine. And there's a case that I'm, I'm writing about right now in the United States, which is called the case of the Holy Land Foundation. There's been persecution and prosecutions of Palestinians, Arabs, and Muslims in America and all over the West, actually, for a very long time now. I'm sure you've all heard the term Islamophobia. And if anybody doesn't think that Israel is behind it, then they're dead wrong. They're out of their minds. So Palestinians were forced out of their land, but that's not good enough because the existence of Palestinians and Arabs and Muslims who probably support them is a threat to the narrative. So they have to be persecuted, and when possible, they have to be prosecuted for doing, well, whatever it is we can catch them doing. The case of the Holy Land Foundation is a, fund, is, is a foundational case. The Holy Land Foundation in the United States was the largest Muslim charity in America, and it was run by Palestinians. Their focus was Palestine, but they, gave, they, brought, they offered relief after 9-11, after the Oklahoma City bombings, in floods, and earthquakes, not only in the U.S., but all around the world, in Turkey and other places. And of course, tremendous relief they were able to offer in Palestine, helping the poorest of the poor. And throughout the 1990s, the ADL, the Anti-Defamation League, you may have heard of them, they're a racist, fascist organization that pretends to be a human rights organization or a civil rights organization, began poisoning the atmosphere against the Holy Land Foundation, saying that, they are, um, that their uh, tax-exempt status needs to be taken away, that they are supporting terrorists, that they're Hamas people, and so forth. Right after 9-11, a couple of months after 9-11, George Bush finally announced that the Holy Land Foundation will be closed, their assets seized, because they are a major terrorist funding network. About eight years later and two trials later, five men were imprisoned. And I've been speaking to their lawyers, and I've never seen lawyers cry as much as the lawyers who represent these, these men. The frustration where the defense case is so strong, the prosecution case is so weak, yet the prosecution wins time and time, appeal after appeal after appeal. And to quote from one of the lawyers, he says, the entire judicial system has been taken hostage. The Constitution, government regulations, laws of the land have been suspended, largely as a result of pressure from Israel the post-9-11 hysteria, and the cowardice of the judiciary. Five men, Abdul Rahman Ode, 15 years, Mufid Abdul Qadir, 20 years, 
Shukri Abu Bakr, 65 years. Now these three I met and I was able to visit in prison. The other two are Hassan Ilashi, 65 years, and Muhammad al Mizain, 15 years. These men never did a thing wrong, did never hurt a fly. And this is a federal, these are federal uh, cases. The story is so horrifying and so horrific that it's beyond belief. And this is one case in the United States. There are other cases all over Europe. There are lots of other cases in the United States. And their only crime is that they are being Palestinian and Muslim and caring all at the same time and caring about Palestine. They're not involved with politics. They were involved with relief. But the entire idea that you could have this kind of an organization and it becomes a credible organization, a trustworthy organization, run by Muslim Palestinians, that has to be destroyed for the sake of the narrative. So again, when people talk about Islamophobia, Islamophobia is not a myth. The largest portion of hate crime cases, certainly in the United States, are not anti-Semitism. They're Islamophobia. And I suspect this happens here as well. Now we're going to go back to Palestine for a little bit, and I think this is a very, very important map. Between 1949 and 1967, this is the map of Palestine, and Israel occupied, or the state of Israel was established on the vast majority of Palestine. Well, there's lots of ways to say it, lots of different ways we can say this, but the majority of, of Palestine was occupied, and that was Israel. And when Israel occupied Palestine initially in 1948, Israel chose to leave the Gaza Strip and the West Bank out of the boundaries of Israel. Israel delineated these borders. Israel decided they were going to stay outside of the boundaries of Israel. And then in 1967, of course, the war broke, is, there was a war and Israel took these last two parts of Palestine. But what's very interesting is, is there's this idea out there that the occupation of Palestine began in 1967. That the occupied Palestinian territories are the West Bank and Gaza. So I scratch my head and I think, wait a minute, are there Palestinian territories that are not occupied? Have we completely forgotten that the vast majority of Palestine has been occupied since 1948? That hundreds and hundreds of towns and villages were destroyed? That nearly a million people were forced into exile and now live in refugee camps? And that the state of Israel, a racist colonialist project, was built on the, on the ashes of Palestine? Have we forgotten this completely? The largest portion of Palestine was taken in 1948. Palestine had been occupied since 1948. The vast majority of destruction that was done to Palestine was done in the first 20 years in the larger part of Palestine. How could anybody say that the occupation of Palestine began in 1967 and say this with a straight face? It's a kind of absurd amnesia. Now, talking about 1967, I'll tell you a little bit about my father, the general. So he, did, he had a very interesting career, which is, you know, and I talk about it in the book uh, quite a lot. But he did two things that, that made him stand out. Um, before the war, in the weeks and months leading up to the war of 1967, his voice was probably the loudest among the Israeli high command, pushing the Israeli cabinet to start the war. And I quote from the, I've, I've read the minutes of the meetings of the Israeli high command and their meetings with the Israeli cabinet, and I quote it in the book. It's really uh, remarkable stuff, very uh, interesting stuff. But he talks to the cabinet and he demands, not, he's not the only one, but he's probably the most fierce, demanding that the Israeli army be permitted to start the war. Immediately after the war was over, at the very first meeting of the Israeli high command, he stands up and he says, we now have to allow the Palestinians to establish their own state in the West Bank and Gaza. He says it immediately after the war. And he says, if we don't do this, then we will have resistance, we will have terrorism, and eventually we will not have a Jewish state. We will have a binational state. He says that right after the war. 
As he was saying these very words, Israeli bulldozers were already in East Jerusalem, in the West Bank, destroying Palestinian towns, destroying Palestinian neighborhoods, forcing hundreds of thousands of Palestinians out into exile from the West Bank. Exactly what Israel did in 1948. Continuing the exact same thing that they started earlier, 20 years earlier. And building for Jews only at the expense of Palestinians, which is what Israel had done from the very beginning. My father retired from the military about a year after that. And he continued to promote and talk about this idea of what we know today is called the two-state solution. This idea of a small, insignificant Palestinian state on a small portion of Palestine that will allow Israel to maintain itself as a Jewish state and will live with it in peace and so forth. Eventually, they got, they got the attention of major figures within the Palestine Liberation Organization, the PLO. And they began a conversation, a very interesting conversation, I'm talking about the 1970s. <clears throat> In this picture, my father is with the late Aysam Sartawi. He was the uh, PLO ambassador in Paris for many, many years. And he was the main, one of the main figures that supported this idea within the PLO. And they had two challenges. One was to convince the Palestinian leadership, particularly Yasser Arafat, to drop the demand to free all of Palestine, drop the demand for the refugees to return, recognize the state of Israel, and engage in peace talks. And to do the same with the Israeli government, to convince the Israeli government to recognize the rights of Palestinians and to engage in dialogue or peace talks. We know that eventually they were successful. 1988, Yasser Arafat did exactly that. Early 1990s, we have the peace talks. We also have the Oslo Peace Accord. And there were a few moments there where many people, I would say, dare to say even most people, had some hope. That perhaps this was really leading to something. Soviet Union had fallen. Apartheid in South Africa had fallen. It was time for Palestine. It made sense. And it wasn't very long before it was clear that this promise was no promise, but a recipe for catastrophe, a recipe for disaster. And when people today say the Oslo peace process failed, I, ha I disagree. I have to argue with that. The Oslo process was a tremendous success. It did exactly what it was supposed to do. Create fragmentation among the Palestinians, Strengthen the Israeli control over the land, the people, and the resources. And make life for Palestinians worse than it's ever been. And that's exactly what happened. And eventually, many of the people who thought Oslo was going to be a good thing, including my father, recognized and stated that Oslo had nothing to do with peace. My father died in 95. The last article he wrote was a requiem to Oslo saying that if Rabin never wanted peace, the Israeli government was not interested in peace. And this was when Rabin was getting the Nobel Peace Prize. Now there's this picture that I think tells it all. This is the picture of you know, the main figures, the main characters marching down the, the White House to the signing of the Oslo Peace Process, the Oslo, the Oslo Peace Accords. And take a look at the picture. On the one hand, we have Hosni Mubarak, the Egyptian president. On the other end, we have King Hussein of Jordan, two vicious dictators that nobody ever elected, but they are moderate Arabs because they are bribable Arabs, so we like them. And they were bribed to the tune of many billions of dollars to make peace with Israel and support this process. Representing Israel was Yitzhak Rabin, who was a major war criminal. He should have been dragged here to The Hague for his crimes, and instead he was taken to and, and, given, and given a uh, Nobel Peace Prize somewhere else, which is a, a disgrace. And the whole team, this whole group, is being led by an American president. And no American can be president unless they support Israel and support Israeli interests 120%. Just by looking at this picture, it is absolutely clear nothing good could come out for the Palestinians. 
Eventually they succeeded, they brought Arafat back to Palestine, they created and then destroyed the Palestinian Authority and eventually they killed Arafat too, which I think they had wanted to do from the very beginning. To sum it up, to sum up what happened in 1967, it is, we need to come to terms with the fact that it wasn't the beginning of the occupation. 1967 was the completion of the occupation of Palestine. And Israeli generals and Israeli politicians said it themselves. It was finishing the job. They called it finishing the job. Taking the West Bank and, and the rest of it. Finishing the job of 1948, completing the conquest of the land of Israel. And in doing so, they finalized the creation of a single state over all of Palestine with exclusive rights for Jewish people. They choose to call it a Jewish state, which I think is a little strange because the majority of the people who live there are not Jewish and the majority of Jewish people do not live there. So why exactly is it, is a, it is a Jewish state? I'm not sure. They certainly don't live by any Jewish values that I know. But it's, they call it the Jewish state. The only thing they do is, which makes it kind of Jewish, I suppose, is they offer exclusive rights to Jewish people and in doing all of that, they wiped, at least in their own mind, erased Palestine off the map for good. It is all Israel. If you look at maps in school books, weather maps, nature maps, political maps, you name it, it's all Israel. Rarely do they ever show a single Palestinian state, uh, city within that, within that, within these maps. Now, if there one, there's one thing Palestinians are not permitted to do is resist. Palestinians are permitted to be victims and they're permitted to be terrorists. But they're not permitted to resist. When it's, when it's uh, armed resistance, then of course that's terrible. If it's unarmed resistance, then it's anti-Semitism. And that's terrible too. Palestinians need to sit quietly and behave well until one morning Israelis might wake up in a good mood and allow them a state or allow them some rights or allow them a little bit of water. And that's the end of the story. God forbid that Palestinians resist. God forbid that we should recognize that the Palestinian resistance is morally and legally allowed and justified. Particularly if it's in Gaza. During the Israeli in, uh, massacre and invasion in 2014, young Palestinians fought heroically against this war machine. And had they not been Palestinians, the entire world would have recognized them and remembered their names for the heroism they displayed. But we can't say that because they're Palestinians and we have to call them terrorists. There's a great quote from Franz Fanon about colonialism and I think if ever anybody described the state of Israel accurately, it is this quote. It is not a machine capable of thinking. It is not endowed with reason. It is violent and only responds to violence. That is the state of Israel. He talks about colonialism in general. But you could not write a better description of the state of Israel than this. But God forbid that we talk about resistance in the context of Palestine. Everybody else is allowed to resist. Palestinians, no, because that's anti-Semitism and you cannot resist against Jews. I think thankfully today, we have the experience in India, we have the experience of blacks in America, we have the experience in South Africa, and we have a very long experience of the Palestinian resistance itself, which by the way, has been mostly unarmed. And these show us today that there are other ways to defeat colonialism other than using arms. Other ways, in other words, unarmed resistance. And you ready for the third one? This is how we deal with colonialism today. Polit isolation, economic pressure, boycott, divestment, and sanctions. BDS, BDS, BDS. That is how...
That is how it needs to be done. That is how it's done. It is morally the right thing to do. It is principled. It works. It's methodical. It has a track record. I was in South Africa. Everybody I met, activists, non-activists, blacks, whites, anybody I met, said, thank God for BDS. BDS brought down apartheid. And BDS, in regards to Palestine, has had some very serious victories as well. That is how we protest. And it, by the way, it's the easiest form of resistance. Because you can take it to any level you want. Just by not buying, you already, you're already resisting. Just by putting down a product, you're already resisting. If you want to take it to the next level, then you talk to the store manager and you tell them why you're not buying. And you want to take it to the next level, you start a BDS branch and you become an activist, like I know many of you are. That's all you have to do. It is the right thing to do. It is not anti-Semitic, regardless of how often they try to jump up and down and say it's anti-Semitic. There is absolutely no foundation for that claim. But that's all they've got. So in Britain, they came up with this nonsense of anti-Semitism. And the Labour Party started apologizing and suspending people. God forbid that the Jews would get angry. But why is it okay to, to have sanctions against Iran and have sanctions against Russia, but not have sanctions against Israel? How is it different? Well, Jews get, uh, get, uh, get to walk away with murder and that's it forever? Why is it okay? The only reason the claim of anti-Semitism exists is because they have nothing else to say. It's like children. They have nothing else to say, though they start calling each other names. And the most important thing that we can do is completely ignore these arguments. Not get into an argument, yes, anti-Semitic, no anti-Semitic, yes, anti-Semitic, no anti-Semitic. Who cares? They want to talk about anti-Semitism? Fine. We talk about murdering children in Gaza. We talk about the fact that the majority of the population, the majority of the population, which are Palestinians today in Palestine, are allocated 3% of the water. We talk about thousands of political prisoners. We talk about human rights abuses. And we talk about racist laws. They want to talk about anti-Semitism. They can do it all day long. It is irrelevant and has no foundation. In the U.S., there's another group, a wonderful group uh, on campuses called Students for Justice in Palestine. And they do fantastic work all over the U.S. And you may have heard that Bernie Sanders, in his, in his debate with Hillary Clinton, his last debate, when he was asked about, Pal about Israel, he said clearly Israel used excessive force in Gaza, murdering over a thousand people, injuring tens of thousands, and so forth. He could never have said that if it wasn't for all the years of activists, Palestine Solidarity, Students for Justice in Palestine, the BDS campaigns. He, that would never have happened. This is how change happens. And Israel is terrified of this, terrified of BDS. I was at a conference, like I told you, where the European, uh, where the EU um, ambassador talked about how much, how they welcome the products from the settlements. It was a major conference on how to combat the BDS, and the BDS is any Palestine solidarity that's out there. They're absolutely terrified, and it's a good thing, because that means it's working. So rather than back away when they say anti-Semitism, we need to push forward even harder and not apologize because there is nothing for which our side needs to apologize. If there's any apology, apology needs to be done, it is by the Israelis. And I don't think it's going to take many, many years of apologies before they can make up for the, their crimes, their pay for their crimes against the Palestinians. But having said all that, I think that we are all duty-bound to find hope. All of us sitting here, as they say, uh, rich, free, and alive, all at the same time. We are duty-bound to find hope and act. Saying it is hopeless is unacceptable. Saying there's no solution is unacceptable. Saying there's nothing we can do is unacceptable. We must find hope and then we must act. This is our duty as people of conscience. These are our duty as humans. And the question, of course, is where do we find hope? 
Is there hope in occupied Palestine with exclusive rights for Jewish people? Because the only way to have a Jewish state in Palestine that offers exclusive rights for me and for any Jew at the expense of Palestinians is by having thousands of political prisoners, constant attacks on Gaza, racist laws, and an apartheid regime. That's the only way you can have a Jewish state or a state with exclusive rights for Jews in an Arab country. Is there hope there? Is there any way to have hope there? Because that is the state of Israel. There is no other liberal, pie-in-the-sky, peace-loving Israel. That is it. That is the name of the game. And if the last 68 years haven't convinced people, the new appointment for defense minister, this monster, racist, brutal terrorist, Avigdor Lieberman, should tell us something. Just when we thought things could not go worse, get worse, they appointed, Netanyahu appoints this guy, to be in charge of the arsenal to be in charge of the, of the weapons. Can you imagine? Just when we thought that these other guys were as bad as it can get. So this is the state of Israel and that's it. Supporting it, liking it, loving it, wanting it, talking about how Israel has a right to exist means supporting this. What exists today. So is there hope there? I certainly don't see it. How about a free democratic Palestine with equal rights, with freedom, with respect for human rights. A Palestine that is not Israel. A Palestine that is not governed by a racist colonialist regime. A Palestine that does not have racist laws. A Palestine in which water is allocated to all people equally, not 97% to one part of the population and 3% to the majority of the population, which like I said, are Palestinians. And I would argue that that is where hope lies. A free democratic state with equal rights, following the model of South Africa, ending the regime that exists there today. That is the way forward. Respecting the rights of the refugees and making sure that those rights are materialized. Understanding that there need to be reparations paid. Understanding that there needs to be an end to the siege in Gaza freeing the political prisoners, that is a reality in which we might see, we can see hope. And that is the reality for which we must all fight. And I want to leave you with this image. This is a picture that uh, we took in a Palestinian refugee camp. A horrifying refugee camp. Conditions that are so horrifying, you cannot hold your tears. None of us, not a single one of us in this room would be able to spend a day, an hour, let alone a lifetime in a camp that looks like this and smile. None of us would smile. In fact, we couldn't smile for a very long time after we visited this camp. And I want to talk a little bit about, or end with, this idea of what is a free Palestine. When we say free Palestine, what does that mean? Unless we are absolutely clear about what a free Palestine is, we will never see a free Palestine. A free Palestine means from the river to the sea. It means from the Galilee to the Nakab Desert. It means Jerusalem, it means Yaffa, it means Haifa, it means Akka, it means every place in between, Bisaba, all of Palestine free from occupation, free from colonialism, free from the brutality of the military and the secret police, free from uh, political prisoners, thousands of them. And this Palestine is not a dream. This Palestine must be a reality, and it can be a reality. And if we do our job, this free Palestine will be a reality and much sooner than most people think. Thank you all very much.